Pomponius Stylus, Chapter 1. And perhaps it will be pleasing to have remembered these things one day. Rome, AD 19, Emperor ruling Tiberius, Chapter 1. The unusually warm early sun beats down over Rome, a city pulsating with people and industry. A city of contrast, over one million people, free man and slaves, wealthy men, the ruling classes, the patricians, senators and their cohorts, carried along through the wide open central forum. Vigorous meetings taking place to discuss affairs of state and commerce. Alongside these wide streets spread out the ordinary people, the plebeian market traders displaying their wares to passers-by. Brightly dyed woolens woven by the city's many artisans, slaving in the narrow confines of workshops owned and controlled by wealthy families. Exotic birds and animals for slaughter screech out in their cages along with the cacophony of vendors, each vying for a possible sale. Spices pervade the air. Perfumes of the East, meats, bread, olive oil in terracotta containers. Amphors stamped with the vintage wine of Pompeii fill the scene. This exotic mixture of human endeavour, voices, experiences and turmoil creates a heady air of intoxicating sweetness and suffocating odour over the narrow labyrinth of roads and side streets. The traveller wandering these many diverse streets can look ahead and beyond this scene to high above the city and see a view of the Alban Hills where a shimmering haze hangs heavy overhead and the shikardas beat a resonating call from the woods. Since early in the life of Pomponia, this had been her experience each summer. The bursting of jasmine perfume in the atrium gardens evoked the beginning. Thus began the removal of the family along with their slaves and carriages, possessions and horses from their house in Rome's elite wide avenues, Domus Gregoria, to their summer residence south of Rome. Their sumptuous Villa Julian was a day's journey on the fertile ridge of the volcanic Alban Hills, a landscape of rolling olive clad fields nest in verdant forests. Pomponia had grown up enjoying the lavish care and attention of her mother Asinia daughter of Vipsania, closely related to the imperial families of Rome. Her father, Gaius Pomponius Crescinus, a man used to dealing justly and fairly as chairman of the Senate, Suffolk consul to the people in 16 AD, dealt kindly with his family, affording them many liberal extravagances. As a young girl, she was given great freedom of expression and was allowed to join in with the studies with her brothers. Her father, ever the man of skilled rhetoric and oration, had enjoyed close companionship with the poet Ovid, and at times would read aloud from the scrolls the words of the many great poets in a mellow, soft voice Pomponia loved to listen to. She reflected even in these formative years on great wisdom and weighed up the meaning of words she didn't understand, always eager to learn more. She raised questions and sought the answers, her father was amused to indulge this child. He gave her papyrus scrolls and inks for her to draw with, and gradually she learned to write. He also gave her a leather-bound cover to keep her scrolls safely wrapped up tightly inside. He never stopped marvelling at how beautiful she was. She was beautiful from child to adult. He found great happiness in staring into her steady, deep brown eyes. They held his gaze seemingly without blinking. As she grew, her eyes expressed her thoughts, changing in an instant from merriment to scorn or brimming up with unshed tears, her mouth always ready with a smile for her dearest father. As a baby, she would follow his face and on hearing his voice would gurgle with delight. The fine down-like hair covering her hair deepened to brunette, grew long and straight, and as the sun caught it, glints of amber and gold highlighted its silken sheen. Peter Familius, her father, grew accustomed to her ready smile, which extended to the faintest dimples when highly amused, changing to a quiver of pouting lips 
when misunderstood or she was fearful of rebuke. Thus proceeded the formative years of this young girl, as her mind collected, assimilated and formulated knowledge from her tutors, so her personality and values were moulded. She became accustomed to being cosseted and bathed by her mother's many slave girls. They sang to her in languages she gradually started to love. The tongue of the Greeks was heard from her mother's slave girl, Selene, the dark, lustrous-eyed, quiet one. Pompeia was always fascinated with the gold bangles, with serpent's heads that hung around the arms of Selene. She loved the Hispanics and the Hebrews, particularly Hannah, the shy Hebrew slave girl from Caesarea, who had joined the household when Hannah was six, herself 10 years of age. Hannah had attended to Pomponia since she was two, becoming her trusted confidant and companion. Hannah protected and guarded her young charge. Pomponia listened to the strange words the Hebrew slave girl Hannah and Joanna spoke to each other, and gradually she pieced together their expressions. The intonations of their voices became familiar to her. By the time Pomponia was eight years of age, she had joined with her two elder brothers in their lessons from scholars Andreticus and Colossinius. She learned to speak and read in Latin, Greek and Hebrew. The brothers squabbled and played, acting out being gladiators and victors of great battles. They dressed up in the clothing of mighty emperors and leaders of the Praetorian Guard, conquering slaves, protecting the emperor. Pomponia laughed at their antics, little knowing that soon these days of close childish companionship would end. This was to be their last season together as children in Domus Gregoria on the Aventine Hill. They all knew from cradle to youth that they were a family closely connected by birth to the ruling powers of this mighty empire. The many gods and festivals of their country were intertwined with their lives. Pomponia's brothers Quintus the Elder and Lucius the Younger had that very much reached their maturity. The festival marking this coming of age, Liberalia, had been an exciting time for all the family. Their father had taken them to the forum where they had been presented as adults. After the initial presentation, many great families had joined in the festivities. Pomponia's cousin, Julia, along with other families, including the family of Successius and Veturia, Gaius and Geminia of the household of Emperor Tiberius. The streets were lined with young and old. As the procession filtered through Rome's avenues, great festivities ensued. Wine and honey, sweetmeats and cakes were carried from Via Appia towards the Circus Maximus and onto the Temple of Hercules near the shore of the River Tiber. The gods of Jupiter and Juno were duly praised. On the altar, the young men discarded from around their necks the golden ruler of their childhood. They were presented with a pure white toga virilis, signifying their entry into manhood. Discarding the bordered garment of their infancy, toga protexta. Amidst all of this, Pomponia watched as her mother quietly stepped out of the crowd and placed her hand on the altar where the boys had laid their bullae. She looked around, then carefully placed them into her cloak. Pomponia wondered what was the significance of this secretive act? Why had her mother taken these ornaments? During the following days prior to the family's departure to Villa Julian, their house was full of visitors, families of the elite. Pomponia watched on as preparations were being made. She felt like she was constantly in the way, always being ushered to run errands for her mother. She sensed the tension and excitement in the air. Her great aunt Tanisia arrived with her daughters Lucilla and Corinna. Lucilla was tall and rather ungainly like her mother. She was already married at 15 years and loved to repeat her household gossip and, if possible, shot Pomponia with tales of marital infidelities and intimacies. Corinna was of a more timid nature, pale in complexion and very vacant in expression, but she too had an insatiable interest in other people's affairs, along with a constant prattle about her great wardrobe and collection of jewels bestowed upon her for her dowry and future marriage. The mothers drank wine together and spoke of their own children's achievements and future 
supposedly assured expectations. Oh, Fabius is now with the Praetorian Guard. He's always next to the Emperor Tiberius and is required to advise and protect. He's had many honours bestowed on him. I know he is privy to many secrets and confidential matters of state. Why, the other day, uh, well, perhaps not now, but he is destined for greatness. Tanisha looked around as she lowered her voice and realised the moment for disclosure was not for the ears of so many that were present in the triclinium. Asinia moved a little closer. The girls had been chattering instinctively also went silent. The older aunt glanced through her inscrutably painted face, topped by an elaborate headdress which, to Pompeia's delight, wobbled and had a slightly ungainly tilt towards the right side. Now she pursed her lips together tightly. This had the effect of a rather dried up sun ripened grape. The effect on Pomponi was to create in her an urge to giggle, which resulted in a laughing fit, heavily disguised as a cough. Everyone was distracted and with many offers of water and the suggestion by her aunt, that young girl needs a lesson in deportment and how to respect her elders. Asinia gave a guarded look to Pomponia and requested the girls retreat to the atrium to play. Pomponia could not help but wonder what secrets her aunt knew regarding the emperor. That night, in the quiet stillness, she took out her tablet and wrote down the day's activities. The style was light and frivolous and her memory keen with the details of people, her aunt's appearance, the girl's way of walking, their banal conversations, her mother's unspoken directions to her. She recalled the moment when her mother had taken the bull eye from the altar at the Temple of Hercules the previous day. She recorded all of this with detail and accuracy. As her lamp flickered, Pomponia closed her slate and placed it into the ornate heavy chest that lay at the end of her bed. She had a smaller iron box to keep her writing scrolls bound in leather and inks along with her iron stylus for her wax slates. These were her most treasured possessions. Her thoughts, her feelings, her young hopes and future dreams were the writings Pomponia valued and she carefully preserved them secret in her box. The next month prior to the summer of 19 AD, Pomponia's mother worked for days, delegating the work of gathering all the supplies and stock, as well as organizing the slaves to procure food for the summer journey to Villa Julian. There was a need for extra slaves and bodyguards for their passage. When it became known that wealthy families and their household, along with many possessions, were travelling, vagabonds and thieves looked for a good opportunity to steal. Pomponia was called to assist and carefully watch and observe how to delegate and organise lists of the provisions needed. She was now fully competent in writing. There were numerous orders and payment requests that were needed. It was her favourite time of the day as she sat close by her mother. She learned from her mother the skills of bartering for the best price for food, wine and basic materials. Asinia was an astute businesswoman and had brought to her marriage great wealth and property. As was law in Roman society, her husband had full control of all her assets. However, Asinia was highly valued wife and over the many years of their marriage, Gaius had seen that to leave to her the accruing of land and more property was a wise course of action. Asinia also engaged over 20 workers in the production of woolen material. Early on, she'd seen the great need for such garments to be procured by the vast growing army of the empire. She had succeeded through her close family members in making alliances with the artisans who supplied cloaks and garments. As the armies grew, so did Asinia's business and profits. One evening after the family had eaten their meal together, they were relaxing in the atrium. The early evening lamps had been lit and the gentle spattering of water from the stone faucets in the impluvium cast sparkles of droplets onto the mosaic surrounding this sunken pool. The flowing water created a cooling of the summer air. The atmosphere was one of convivial tranquility. Pomponia closed her eyes tightly. 
She wanted to imprint indelibly in her memory this picture for future winter months and times when the family would all be in different parts of the empire. Peter rose from his table and asked the slaves to leave them. He looked intently at each one in turn, then requested the boys and Pomponia along with the Sinia to follow him into the main room, the Tibilinum. The atmosphere was slightly tense. Only the family dog Rufus twitched and snapped at flies whilst carrying on thumping his tail against the cool marble floors. Then lazily, realising everyone had departed, trotted along after the family. The family followed Gaius as family head in procession. What was the purpose of this formal request? Each pondering their own thoughts they followed with slight hesitant trepidation through the atrium into the tablinum where all the family records were kept. It was their father's domain. The walls were richly decorated with fresco paintings of hunting scenes, beautiful flora and fauna in bright gold and red and green. It was a delight for the senses and gave them all a preview of their life at Villa Julian woodland groves, hills, pools, and landscaped gardens. Although the room was lit only by one open window, and now the three pedestal oil lamps, it did appear light and inviting. Along the side stood marble statues of their forebears, illustri illustrious poets, Ovid, the dear friend of Publius, recently deceased, their closely related empress, Sextus Julius Caesar and Augustus. To the men of the household, these were daily reminders of their ancestry and destiny as future rulers and statesmen. Gaius waved his right arm across towards them all, gesturing for them to be seated on the couches facing where he was standing. I wish to speak to you all as the great family of Publius Pomponius Graecinus. Our noble family has a great history of senators, generals, magistrates, consuls. Gaius turned toward his eldest son. Today, my son Quintus, you have worked well with your scholars. Andraticus has informed me that your grasp of Latin and the poets, as well as Greek and mathematics, is of a high standard. Well done. Today, I give you this gift of a golden hand statue of the goddess Minerva. May you gain and possess all wisdom from our great goddess. In honour of your reaching your maturity, you will progress now to study further philosophy and judicial oratory. For this, you will go to Alexandria for two years to the school founded by the family of Chalcenteris, whose father Didymus was a great friend of mine. You will benefit greatly from his oratory and many writings. It is said Didymus wrote over 3,000 manuscripts. You will read well. Upon your return, you will progress in matters of state and rhetoric to one day represent this family in the Senate. Quintus, the eldest son being addressed, was now 16 years of age. He was handsome and was all too aware of his charms and allure. His glossy dark hair framed a high forehead and deep set eyes that today looked with keen anticipation of the gifts and honours expected of the eldest son. Raising, raising his glistening dark eyes to his father, with proud demeanour, he triumphantly stood up and approached him. I most graciously thank you, my father, for this honour of representing our family in the school at Alexandria. You will not be sorry for giving me this great honour. For this I have been destined and this gift I will treasure. It will not leave my person. Gaius turned his attention to Lucius. He was smaller in stature than Quintus, but his, his years of athletic endeavours had built a muscular and strong body. With his swarthy, ruddy complexion, he exuded power and dynamism. Lucius had spent many hours in outdoor pursuits. It was at the Circus Maximus and particularly the chariot race is when he became the most animated. He was able to recount the finest details, the breed and formation of the horses and the many refinements of the chariots, 
The four horse chariot, the quadriga was his favorite because of the speed that could be realized. His father had taken him from an early age to the arena, sensing his keen interest in outdoor pursuits. Now, my son Lucius, you have shown great promise in your equestrian skills. Alongside Quintus, you have succeeded in mastering and reaching a standard that is satisfactory in your scholarly endeavors. However, your skill as a horseman is spoken of greatly by your tutor Colonius, the keeper of my horses. You will be enrolled for two years under the equestrian family of our noble Gaius Rebellius Blandus in Tiber to continue your training there. Well done. May the goddess Diana be your guide. She will speed you in your equestrian pursuits and hunting. Take this golden hand statue with you today. Lucius rose and bowed before his father and with his hands that were used to controlling fast moving stallions, gently and tenderly, took the miniature statue, raising it on high in honour to the gods and his father. All the time that his father was bestowing his blessings and gifts upon her brothers, Pomponia felt a deep sense of honour and family pride. She felt blessed to have a father that truly cared for his children and that the privilege of wealth and circumstances afforded them such opportunities as young people. Her thoughts raced ahead to her elder brother decked with fine robes and fated by senators and statesmen. Lucius too, a knight of the Praetorian Guard, avenging evils, rescuing prisoners, slaying villain, villains. As her imagination raced forward in time, she heard the voice of her father. Pomponia, my child, come forward. This is a time of great change for you too. You have reached nearly your 15th year of life. This summer, we will enjoy the delights of Villa Julian together. You too have sat alongside your brothers and been attentive to studying the languages of people our great nation has conquered. I have heard you Latin, Greek, Hebrew, and I know you understand the Hispanics too. I've heard you sing in all these languages. Pompania felt encouraged to raise her eyes to her father and by her gaze inquiringly wondered if he wanted her to sing at that moment. No, no, my little one, another time we'll hear the delights of yours. Today I have a gift for you. He reached onto the low tripod marble table to his left and removed a cloth of finest wool, which he handed to Pomponia. She unwound the cloth and there in the centre was a small casket, heavily engraved with the golden acanthus leaves, elongated and curled at the end of each leaf, symbolising the enduring life of the family. They were alternating with olive leaves, which she knew represented peace. As she opened the cask, there, wrapped in the finest wool of purple and gold, was an exquisitely engraved golden stylus. She would use this pointed instrument for writing on wax tablets. It measured from her index finger to her wrist and was fashioned in finely textured gold relief. At one end, it had been crafted to a sharpened point and along its shaft had been chased the words, my dearest daughter Pomponia, may your thoughts go down in writing and endure. Pomponia lifted the stylus to her lips and kissed the words. Her fingers held it poised as if to write. Then she traced a line from its point along the words to the relief of acanthus and olive leaves intricately round, around the shaft below its flattened circular end. My dearest father, you've honoured me today along with my brothers. May I also be worthy of this gift. I'll always treasure it. Use it wisely too, father. She looked across at her mother, her eyes shining with love for the family she'd shared her young life with. Her mother inclined her head in a slight movement acknowledging Pomponia's gratitude. She looked away, her own eyes filled with brimming tears as she remembered her own coming of age, how she had been filled with so many hopes and aspirations, an innocent naivety of belief, the freshness of guileless youth, how she longed to rush forward, warn her, inform her, tell her the truth about human nature and its twists and inconsistencies, 
But no, her confidence must be in this young woman and the many hours of training and family guidance that had taken place. And yes, one more summer at Julian, it surely must count. The road to Villa Julian was at first sight straight and unencumbered. However, very soon on leaving the main streets of Rome, it became dusty and filled with potholes. There had been a series of severe storms and the rain had beaten down hard on the tracks out of Rome, closely followed by a dry parching wind and sun from the south. The journey took one full day and along the route, the heat of Rome gradually subsided. The many umbrella pine trees shaded the initial trek out of Rome. They passed travellers and traders on the way, all heavily laden with their country fare, grown to feed the people who remained in Rome during the hot days of summer. Pomponia and her mother were in the large carriage, the carpentum with its high wooden sides and arched canvas overhead covering. Although noisy as the iron wheels rattled along over the stones and hardened mud pathways, the journey was without incident as the four mules pulled them along. The family had three of these carriages along with five wooden carts where all these various goods, clothing and household requirements were carried along. Gradually the air changed. The verdant landscape took on a tranquil beauty of rolling hills and valleys surrounded by tall chestnut and beech trees. Early wild jasmine and lily of the valley add a distinct perfume to the air. The Alban hills came clearer into view and Pomponia leant forward, parting the canvas that had shielded them out of Rome. She had an immense feeling of freedom seeping into her mind and her whole body relaxed into a dreamlike state as they moved closer to Villa Julian. In excited anticipation, she knew she could roam the paths and tracks around the villa unaccompanied. There were times when she could slip into shallow pools, step over stones barefoot and float lazily on her back, shielding her eyes from the sparkling sun's reflection on the surface of the water. She could take lungfuls of breath and dive deep down into clear waters, rising again to rushes of cool liquid soaking her hair and body like a new awakening. No one to restrain and protest at her scantness of clothing or lack of foot coverings. Living out in the country, she could maintain her childish ways for just a little longer before age and responsibilities were placed upon her youthful shoulders. Pompeni was aroused from these musings by a thundering noise of horses galloping by and whinnying snorts. The carpentum had come to a standstill. She looked out from behind the canvas covering at a swathes of brightly coloured bronze and red emblazoned marching armies swept by. It was a contingent of the Roman army. To Pomponia's eyes, it seemed to be masses of soldiers. It was in fact three units of centurions. They had been marching overland from conquests in Cilicia. The outriders were three of high rank. The elder to Pomponia's eyes looked about 50 years of age. He wore the uniform of a high-ranking leader. His face was swarthy, weathered and brown, but his eyes were keenly sweeping the area all around them. Becoming aware of their carriage, he slowed down alongside them. Gaius rode forwards with Quintus and with Lucius, who'd been accompanying them, but drew alongside the leader. The older man immediately recognised him, as Publius Gaius Pomponius Graecinus, for Gaius had been Suffolk Consul of Rome in 16 AD. He had sat in the Senate with Gaius some three years previously. Greetings to your noble family. It is with great pleasure to renew our acquaintance. We wish no delay for your entourage. These men are the last of six legions to leave Rome. I am the legion commander. As you know, Vibius Pronto. This is my second in command, my Tribunicus, Laticlavus Aulus Platius Silvanus. 
The man at our list of maybe 20 years inclined his head toward the two younger boys. They were both looking eagerly towards him, admiring his youth and leadership, longing to hear of the exploits and battles fought. And Gaius noticed this. He moved his horse nearer to Vibius and Aulus, aware that the boys clearly wanted to make the acquaintance of this young leader. Our noble family wishes you goodwill and greetings. We are journeying to our Villa Julian in the Alban Hills. We will be in residence for the coming summer months and your most noble selves as valiant conquerors would always be welcome. To find hospitality, it will be readily given to you. We regularly entertain and it will be most enjoyable for my two sons to make your acquaintance. I'm sure they would be delighted to hear of your many exploits and maybe we could share some hunting on my estate at the Villa Julian. My younger son here is Lucius. He is about to be enrolled for two years with the equestrian family of Gaius Rebellius Blandus in Tiber to continue his training. Alice smiled at the two boys. His face lit up and his tired, weary countenance revived to one of open friendliness. He had a way of being a leader, but with beneficence. His bearing was stately, but his manner was encouraging. Already he had shown valour and was highly respected by his commander. It would be a great pleasure to partake of your family's hospitality. I have many accounts to relate to you and I would greatly enjoy seeing your horses along with engaging in some sport together. First though, we must complete our return to Rome and refresh our horses and men. However, prior to receiving our next directions, we will come and visit you and enjoy some time and relaxation together. As Alice was speaking, one of the mules pulling the carpentum started to twitch and pulled at its harness. This agitated the older mules who kicked out sideways. The wagons creaked and swayed. Pompeia and her mother were thrown across the carriage. With shrieks of fear, Pompeia grabbed at the flapping canvas which ripped in her hands but saved her from falling completely out of the carriage. Aulus reacted instantly. He swept from his horse and reaching for the harness and reins, he climbed onto the front of the carriage. And as Pomponia fell forwards, he succeeded in catching her. Pomponia was dazed and shaking a little, but Aulus gently carried her down the step. He placed her onto a nearby stool into the care of the servants. Asinia called for water and Pomponia was soothed and revitalized. The animals were quieted and Alice stepped to one side. Accepting the long draught of water he was offered, his thoughts returned to his men and his need to quickly leave. He had to be in Rome by nightfall before tiredness overwhelmed them. He called for his horse as Gaius thanked him. All praised him for his quick reactions and graciously reaffirmed the family's pleasure in showing him hospitality at the villa as soon as he was able to return to visit them. He assured them he would do soon. Aulus mounted his horse and after glancing towards Pomponia with a slight bow of his head, he bid the family farewell and rode away with his soldiers. The men resumed their journey on horseback, Pomponia and her mother in the Carpentum. This time, two slaves walked alongside the mules to prevent any further misdemeanors from the beasts. Gaius, along with Quintus and Lucius, rode ahead. There was only a few miles to cover and the early evening sun was streaming low over their valley. They'd been travelling due south all day and the final path veered toward the east. The sun was behind them now and cast long shadows across a landscape of beech trees and verdant green valleys. The hills facing to the south were stepped into vine groves and as they passed, a pair of turtle doves rose to rest on a small chestnut tree already heavily in blossom. As they approached the entrance to Julian, the scent of jasmine filled the air. Pomponia's body was sore, but her heart was light and brimming, yes, fairly bubbling with expectation and suspense. What would this summer's adventures hold for her and her writings, her secrets, her thoughts, there was so much to put down. Tomorrow she would begin on her wax tablets. Her thoughts raced in her mind as she slowly drifted 
into a deep sleep.